Attention. Podcast disclaimer. The writer's intention is to explore real life situations and emotions in this fictional context. Again, this podcast is a work of fiction. Absolutely, none of the events depicted are real. The storylines and characters are purely fictional and created for entertainment purposes. However, please note that this podcast may address sensitive issues that some people may find distressing. It is not suitable for children or individuals who may be sensitive to such content. Viewer discretion is advised. Episode 2, Unveiled Revelations. Welcome to Apostle Wilson's scandalous faith drama, The Pentecostals. Scene 1, New Year's Eve service at Light of Grace Pentecostal Church. The atmosphere at Light of Grace Pentecostal Church is electric as the New Year's Eve service commences. The church comma, filled to its 2,000 member capacity, buzzes with anticipation and spiritual fervor. The choir, backed by a powerful band, fills the sanctuary with soul-stirring gospel music, their voices resonating with a deep passion and faith. Prophetess Mariah Edwards joins the choir, her voice soaring above the rest in a display of pure devotion and talent. Her presence adds a special touch to the already dynamic performance, and the congregation is visibly moved, many lifting their hands in worship. As the music reaches a crescendo, Prophetess Edwards transitions into a few minutes of exhortation. Let us welcome this new year with faith in our hearts and praise on our lips. The Lord has brought us through another year, and His blessings are endless, she proclaims, her voice echoing through the hall. Meanwhile, Angela and Rachel are running late. They rush into the church comma, quickly heading to the restroom. From inside their stalls, they overhear two members gossiping. I'm telling you, Bishop writes up to something, but who's he seeing? That's the million dollar question, one says. The other nods in agreement, their conversation filled with speculation and juicy theories. Angela and Rachel wait until the ladies exit, then come out of their individual stalls and exchange a look, the weight of the secret they share heavy between them. On the pulpit, Bishop Wright maintains a composed demeanor despite the undercurrents of rumor and speculation. He invites prophetess Vanessa Johnson to introduce the guest speaker. Vanessa, one of the founding members who served under Bishop McKenzie, steps forward with a mixture of reverence and emotion. Tonight, we are blessed to have with us the man who founded this church, who stood by many of us in our darkest times. Vanessa begins, her voice trembling slightly. Bishop McKenzie was there for me when I was battling my demons of alcohol and cocaine. His guidance helped deliver me from my despair. The congregation listens, moved by her heartfelt words, and many are brought to tears by her testimony. Bishop McKenzie then takes the stage, his presence commanding yet humble. He delivers a powerful and inspiring message, one that speaks to the hearts of everyone present. His words are a blend of encouragement, faith, and a call to embrace the new year with hope and dedication. Bishop McKenzie's sermon reaches a powerful crescendo as he draws his message to a close. In conclusion, he says, his voice resonating with conviction, the actions of Christian leaders, whether visible or not, have a profound impact on our wider Christian community. Our behaviors can either reinforce the faith and trust of our believers, or, conversely, create ripples of doubt and disillusionment. The congregation listens intently, hanging on to every word. As leaders, he continues, we bear the responsibility to ensure that our actions, both in public and private spheres, genuinely reflect the teachings and values of Christ. In doing so, we not only uphold the integrity of our leadership, but also contribute positively to the spiritual health of the Christian community. In response to Bishop McKenzie's statement about leadership, the atmosphere in the church erupts with praise and applause. The congregation, including members and leaders, stands to their feet clapping their hands and shouting in agreement. The room vibrates with a sense of unity and conviction as their praise resonates throughout the sanctuary. It is a powerful demonstration of their support for Bishop McKenzie's words and their shared commitment to upholding the integrity of Christian leadership. In the midst of this powerful moment, Mrs. Thompson, who is the head of the church board, stands out. Her voice somehow seems louder than the other 2,000 members. She consistently opposes Bishop Wright at every turn. Mrs. Thompson, known for her reserved and composed demeanor, unexpectedly springs to her feet, positioned just a few steps away from the pulpit. Her voice rings out, filled with fervor and conviction, 
as she yells, say it Bishop. Preach the truth, shame the devil, he is a lying wonder. Her affirmations and amens are so loud in that moment, they visually disrupt the solemn atmosphere as attention is shifted to her. As she fervently agrees, she glances pointedly at Bishop Wright, bordering on disruptive and disrespectful behavior. Periodically, as she speaks in tongues, she tries to make her actions appear as genuine spiritual engagement in a not-so-subtle jab at the bishop. But, for those that know Mrs. Thompson, they understand her actions are totally fueled by her disdain for Bishop Wright. The focus shifts back to Bishop McKenzie, who has now left the stage and is literally standing in the crowd, still exhorting and encouraging the people of God to follow Jesus' plan for their lives. Then, as quickly as he started, the bishop quickly brings his sermon in for a landing and makes his way back to the stage. He motions for the musicians to play something soft. Bishop McKenzie, standing at the pulpit, wraps up his stirring sermon with a subtle yet unmistakable message directed towards Bishop Wright. I've had the honor of guiding many leaders on their spiritual journey, including appointing them to positions of responsibility that they probably wouldn't have been able to achieve alone. He says, hundreds in the crowd verbally agreeing and laughed, his voice steady but laden with significance. But, if that's you, and there are about 200 in this room tonight wearing these collars, I need you to remember that those who are lifted can also be brought down if they stray from the path. Leadership in this reformation is a privilege, not a right, and it must be handled with the utmost integrity and humility. Bishop Wright, with a forced smile, feels the weight of Bishop McKenzie's words as he sits on the stage, aware that all eyes are on him. In the midst of the unfolding drama and tensions within the church, comma, it is important to recognize the unique position and authority held by Bishop McKenzie. Although retired, he remains the founding pastor and presiding bishop of the Reformation, which grants him significant influence and power within the organization. Bishop Wright is fully aware that because of his authority as the presiding bishop, Bishop McKenzie possesses the ability to exercise his judgment and make decisions that impact the church and its leadership. As the spiritual overseer, he has the power to remove Bishop Wright from his position if he deems it necessary. In the current context of rumors and speculation surrounding Bishop Wright, the congregation and Bishop Wright himself are aware of the potential consequences of Bishop McKenzie's involvement. The mere suggestion that Bishop McKenzie may intervene or take action adds an additional layer of tension and uncertainty to the situation. Understanding this, Bishop Wright maintains a facade of respect and attentiveness, but his discomfort is palpable. He's acutely aware of the pointed message, feeling both embarrassed and challenged under the scrutiny of the congregation. The mood in the church shifts as prophetess Mariah Edwards and the choir begin to sing a soulful rendition of Elevation Worship song, Come to the Altar. Their voices rise in harmony, filling the sanctuary with a sense of hope and redemption. The music encapsulates the emotional journey of the service, from reflection and admonition to an invitation for renewal. Bishop McKenzie, capitalizing on the moment, extends an altar call. If you feel the call to renew your commitment to Christ, to repent and start anew, I invite you to come forward. Bishop McKenzie, then quotes 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. His voice now cracking with sincere emotion as one of pleading. He beckons, don't you want to be new? Jesus is here right now, waiting for you. Bishop's voice is warm and inviting, a stark contrast to the sternness of his earlier message. The response is overwhelming. Hundreds of people, moved by the sermon and the music, step out of their pews and walk towards the altar. They come with tears, with smiles, with open hearts, ready to embrace a fresh start. The church becomes a sea of people seeking prayer guidance and a chance to give their lives to Christ. Bishop Wright stands and begins to direct the elders and ministers of Light of Grace Pentecostal Church to quickly position themselves to minister to the people as the altar fills with congregants seeking solace and renewal. Angela and Rachel also find themselves amidst the sea of people, both deeply moved by the sermon and the atmosphere of repentance. As one of the female elders stands, literally having to hold Angela, her tears streaming down her face, her body shaking under the power of the anointing in the room. Despite the noise around her, her prayer 
is a private moment of raw emotion and vulnerability. Lord, forgive me, she whispers between sobs, her voice barely audible over the choir singing. I've lost my way, please guide me back. Her plea is one that is heartfelt, a silent cry for forgiveness and guidance amidst the turmoil of her life. Nearby, Prophetess Vanessa Johnson, Angela's mother, lays her hands on Rachel, Angela's best friend, who is crying uncontrollably. Rachel's tears are a mix of guilt and relief, her body racked with sobs as she stands at the crossroads of her own secrets and the path to redemption. Prophetess Vanessa prays fervently for her, her words full of compassion and hope, seeking divine intervention for the young woman she has come to care for deeply. Prophetess Vanessa with fervor and conviction lifts her voice in a powerful prayer of deliverance and spiritual warfare. Lord, I come before you, binding the devil and decreeing Satan loose from Rachel's mind, she prays, her voice resolute and filled with authority. I declare that every chain of darkness and confusion be broken, replaced by your divine clarity and peace. Prophetess Vanessa's prayer continues, her words a declaration of victory and freedom for Rachel. I plead the blood of Jesus over Rachel's thoughts and emotions, rebuking every lie and deception that seeks to torment her. I decree the power of the Holy Spirit to guide her steps and lead her into truth and restoration. With each word, Prophetess Vanessa's voice grows stronger, her prayers reaching the heavenly realms as she intercedes on Rachel's behalf. As the prayer reaches its climax, Prophetess Vanessa's voice resonates with unwavering faith. In the name of Jesus, I declare victory over every stronghold that seeks to hold Rachel captive. Rachel, now prostrate lying on the floor coughing and gagging uncontrollably, a common sight in the Apostolic Pentecostal Church for those that are familiar with the common signs of demonic manifestation and deliverance. Yet, amidst what seemed to be a violent, internal struggle, Rachel is starting to sense her spiritual atmosphere has shifted as Prophetess Vanessa's prayer fills the room, her words carrying the weight of spiritual authority and an unwavering belief in the power of God's deliverance. It is a moment of spiritual warfare as she battles against the forces of darkness and releases the power of God's love and redemption over Rachel's life. As the prayer concludes, Prophetess Vanessa's spirit is filled with a sense of peace and assurance. She rests in the knowledge that her prayers have been heard, trusting in the faithfulness of God to bring about healing and restoration in Rachel's life. In the midst of this, Prophetess Mariah Edwards, still singing, watches Prophetess Vanessa and Rachel from a short distance, her eyes filled with tears and her heart with understanding and a profound sense of empathy. Despite knowing many hidden secrets about Rachel and having had a few heated verbal run-ins, in that moment her dislike for Rachel was gone. Why? Because she too knows the weight of hidden sins and the struggle for deliverance. Quietly, she prays under her breath for Rachel, her words a silent petition for the young woman's freedom from the chains that bind her. The scene closes on this poignant moment, focusing on Prophetess Edward's contemplative face, then panning over the altar where Angela and Rachel, along with hundreds of others, are engaged in a deeply personal journey of confession and repentance. The choir's voices swell in the background, encapsulating the emotional intensity of the moment. Despite capturing the powerful and moving message of Bishop Mackenzie and the dynamic and spiritually charged atmosphere of the New Year's Eve service, at light of Grace Pentecostal Church, this scene also captures the deeply emotional and spiritual experience of Angela. Rachel at the altar, each of them is grappling with their own burdens, while being supported by the prayers of those who understand and empathize with their struggles. I'm Apostle Wilson, and you've been listening to the Pentecostals podcast. You can follow the Pentecostals on Instagram or our Facebook group. Catch all new episodes each week on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Apple Music, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you haven't subscribed on Apple Podcasts, go there now, subscribe, rate, review this podcast. Join me again on next week for another episode of Apostle Wilson's The Pentecostals. Thank you for listening.